Gamar Jova, Dilam Shabi Dovi Sab. Hello and good morning. That is the extent of my Georgian, so we will leave it at that. I would uh, I first like to thank Akake Sertelli State University and the American Studies Center here for allowing me to participate in the conference this morning. I also would like to thank the people of Georgia and the people of Kataisi for making me feel so welcome here in my first two months in country. And two certainly months. two months. Two. Almost two Only. months. Almost two months. And uh, certainly also to the U.S. Embassy and the State Department for giving me the opportunity to be here in the first place. Mm -hmm. I would ask that you uh, please pardon my reliance on notes today as the subject of my, of my comments, as the, the subject of my comments today is the focus of my current studies. So I do not necessarily have the conversational fluency I would need to address you more naturally. Today I would like to talk about the historical context surrounding the current initiative to promote English language learning in Georgia and how this linguistic initiative impacts both Georgia's national development and partnership with the United States. As we will see, the evidence of both nations' commitment to this initiative is quite clear. The United States has chosen to be an active partner in Georgia's pursuit of English as a second language through volunteer organizations such as the Peace Corps and academic, academic and exchange programs such as the FLEX program, sending Georgian students to study in the United States, and the Fulbright and English Language Fellows program, sending United States educators to Georgia. The United States has placed a number of educators in this country who are working not just as teachers, but as teacher trainers to improve teaching methodology to develop curricular materials and assist in processes of certifying English language instructors in this country. And beginning this year, the unofficial presence of Americans has multiplied as Georgia's own Teach and Learn with Georgia program has attracted many American volunteers to participate in this process as well. However, Public opinions in this country on the impacts and significance and consequences of these activities for Georgia's national development has not been without controversy. Given Georgia's long national history of conquest and resistance, a degree of political and cultural concern over relationships with larger powers is quite understandable. Through the lens of history, I hope to provide a perspective on Georgia's English language programs that will ameliorate concerns among some individuals that this initiative represents simply the most modern incident of an external threat to Georgia's national sovereignty and culture integrity. But before taking on this task, we must establish a conceptual definition of the nation and nationality. This morning's discussion will be limited both due to time and my expertise on, on the matter. Accordingly, I have chosen to base my discussion on British historian Benedict Anderson's concept of the nation as an imagined community. Anderson describes the modern nation state as an imagined community that is both inherently limited and sovereign. It is limited in that it has boundaries at which it encounters those of a neighboring nation. It is also limited in that, with notable exceptions, such as German ambitions in World War II, by definition, no one imagines a world in which everyone will become Chinese, much in the way that some people may imagine a world in which everyone will become Christian, or in which everyone will become Muslim. It is sovereign in that it receives primary loyalty from its citizens, and the international community generally accepts a nation's right to self-determination. But nations are conceived as having an inclusive expanse that is both wide and deep. And in almost any case, members of one nation will never encounter a single percentage of their fellow nationals. So what are the ties that bind people in these overwhelmingly <coughs> anonymous imagined communities together into a distinguishable nation. This definition necessitates elaboration on how those boundaries are drawn, what characteristics, distinctions, or circumstances 
define where one nation ends and one begins. Certainly geography is a factor, but even some, the split of even some small island territories into different nations means geography is not definitive. Others may point to biological characteristics or ethnicity, but this doesn't account for multi-ethnic nations such as the United States. Culture is certainly a part of the equation, but the plurality of nations sharing common historical origins, ethnic identities, and even religious traditions under different flags reveals that many major elements of culture are transnational. This brings us to the topic at hand, language. We will briefly mention the political climate from which the idea of the nation emerged, then take a particularly close look at the role of language in allowing the national idea to emerge and shaping the earliest experiments with the model. A sovereign nation has a respected place among an international community of peers with claims to autonomy as legitimate as those of any other. But how did this national model emerge to gain people's most feverish loyalty? According to Anderson, the promotion of local vernaculars through the advent of print capitalism was key. Prior to the invention of the printing press in the middle of the second millennium AD, religion, or empires that justified their legitimacy upon divine ordinance, were the dominant instruments of human governance and social cohesion. Both of these laid claim to a somewhat sacred character and relied on classic languages among the privileged classes, such as Latin, as God's chosen language, the only one through which humans may understand God's will and decrees. This had the effect of drastically limiting the number of individuals who were capable of participating in the act of governance, and made the illiterate masses highly reliant on the word of trusted mediums to guide their affairs. However, the appearance of a printing press led to an unprecedented capacity for translation and distribution of information to, in local vernaculars, allowing for an effective democratization of information. From this process, distinct standard languages were able to emerge and gain legitimacy through their written work. English, French, and German are examples of this in the European context over the last thousand years. These floodgates of information, now available to wider audiences, contributed to the undermining of traditional autocratic governments and the rise of new models based on Enlightenment ideals. The denial of the capacity to read and write is a proven policy for the few to preserve power over the many, used in relatively recent history in the southern United States, with laws making it illegal to teach a slave to read and write. Thus, the expansion of such capacities to read and write necessarily works to the benefit of the learning audience. Over the last 500 years, this has happened to the benefit of local populations at the expense of vast imperial powers. The officialization of local vernaculars through the development of a written form and mass distribution of print materials also contributed to the development of local and native intelligentsias. This process began to develop new local centers of power, where traditional elements of cohesion, such as religious faith, may be preserved, but become part of a new order based on national identity, as Latin was no longer seen to be the one and only true language of God and thus of authority. Distinct distinctions between these emerging print languages would thus define some form of boundary where my ability to understand my neighbor begins and ends, thus establishing a me and an other, an us and them, the beginning of the conceptions of national identity. Over the progress of time, advances in technology and human exploration would introduce civilizations to one another that were previously unknown, shocking many into the realization that their view of history would now be radically challenged 
upon discovering a multitude of human civilizations emerging simultaneously in time and space, each laying claim to a truth about human origins and thus just forms of human governance, which competed with one another and forced all of them into question. Over time, the historical pattern of, the historical pattern of civilizations encountering one another, one based on conquest, conquer or be conquered, gave way to an idea that various nations have just as legitimate claims to sovereignty as any other. Over the last several centuries, through the democratization of information, two large processes have played out. The transition of the individual from subject to citizen, and the appearance of a new evolutionary paradigm in international relations, where societies may grow and flourish in concert, even if sometimes in competition. Language, so it seems, played a critical role not just in the liberation of the individual from absolute authority, but also in the emergence of new social identities emerging to fill that void. But the historian must concede knowledge of history is not just an end in and of itself. It provides a lens through which we can gain perspective on the problems of the present. So how can this understanding of the role of language in national development inform our understanding of the English language initiative in Georgia today? Though Anderson demonstrates the role of language in catalyzing the emergence of the national model, in the 21st century, the role of language is much more limited, and the situation in contemporary Georgia may be more accurately described as the intentional acquisition of a second language, rather than the threat of imposition of a foreign language. This distinction arises both from the limitations of the relationships between language and national identity, and also due to the attended use and context in which the language is being taught. Though language and print vernaculars are part of the formulas that have shaped current national identities, knowledge of a language does not admit one to automatic national membership. Over the course of this year, I am trying to learn some basic elements of the Georgian language. However, even if I were to emerge from this year with native fluency in reading, writing, listening, and speaking, that alone would not make me Georgian. Rather, I will be an American who has acquired a skill that allows me to function outside the normal linguistic boundaries to which I was previously constricted. Further, our world today contains not only a vast collection of distinct national languages, such as Georgian, but also a handful of languages that have expanded beyond their nation of origin to achieve an extra-national prominence. This is certainly the case with languages such as English and Spanish. These are instances in which a common language is shared by members of distinct nationalities. Spanish found all over South America, English found in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and as a connector language of science and business in all corners of the globe. In some ways, the widespread use of these languages is similar to the prevalence of Russian in the former Soviet Union. However, this analogy erodes when one considers the circumstances in which the language expanded to new populations and its function once in place. Unlike Russian in the Soviet era, English is not emerging as a replacement to Georgian as the language of state. English will remain a second language, one that improves Georgia's linguistic connection to the international community without eroding non-English speakers' ability to fully participate in the administration and governance of Georgia's most fundamental affairs. The impetus to adopt English comes from Georgian authorities themselves with Georgian interests in mind not from the decree of an external agent. 